Yes. Hi, Carl. Welcome. We're not started yet. So. <laughs> I'll be right in. Hey, how are you? How are you? Nice to meet you, Carl. <laughs> so, Cora, have you been have you been uh, involved with Peace House since before it was built as well? Or? No, I came on about 13 months ago. Right. And How long will you stay before? I'm only here until Wednesday morning. So but I've been here since Saturday afternoon. So yeah. very I've had a very peaceful time as well. Oh. The the name the name lives up to oh, to the good. environment. <laughs> First few uh the last few weeks doing a lot of traveling and moving around and mm -hmm. you get tired with all these things and uh coming here for the first night it was very, very relaxing coming into this monastic kind of environment. It's a nice wood, natural environment, and I had a very peaceful first night. Well, so. <laughs> Where's home here? Uh, I live in Melbourne at the moment. Um, I'm in a in a monastery and a centre that's. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ajahn Brahm. Yes. Yeah. So a, a, a place that's associated with, with Ajahn Brahm. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. Hey, how are you? Yeah, And do you come here regularly or? I, I do. I live basically right next door. My name oh. is Sonia. Oh, hey, Sonia. How are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> Actually live next door, yeah? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, wow. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, very fortunate place to live. <laughs> Coffee shop and then pizza. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Everything you <laughs> need. Thank you. 
No, that's uh, fine. I can make that kind of cross. Yeah. Could they, could they go? Just like we don't have to let people in. Oh, they can. Oh, good. Is Raleigh there? Yes. Oh, good. It was ex Wong's husband who made this. Oh, okay. Right, right. Wow. Talent, talent guy. Yeah. <laughs> and if the door bell rings, I'll let you Perfect. do my thing. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, so we might get started then. So just by way of introduction, anybody that doesn't know me, uh, you don't know me yet. <laughs> My name is Ajahn Sadaro. I'm from I'm from Melbourne. Uh, I ordained in the Thai forest tradition. Ordained in 2005. I lived in Thailand for about 10 years before going back to Australia. Um, where I currently reside at the Newbury Buddhist Monastery and the Buddhist Society of Victoria in Melbourne. Um, I'm very grateful to you all for putting me up here. Uh, I'm in Boston for a few days, so it's been really nice to stay here. It's been really nice to uh, meet the Sangha here as well. I'm very fortunate that I can come to a place and there's there's other there's other Sangha here. It's always it's always it always feels much better when there's the Sangha around. So I appreciate. Uh, them being very hospitable to me and I appreciate you putting me up as well and building this place to actually uh, uh, use it as a way to facilitate the Dhamma in the in Boston so I think this is a, a very very good thing that you're doing here and I, I really do wish the best for you in this going forward and hopefully I can be some sort of small part of this by saying hopefully a few useful things today so we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes over. So with that, though, maybe we can uh, start off with a with a bit of meditation first. We can do maybe 15, yeah, 15 minutes or so of meditation. And I'll just do some light guidance. So if we want to find a comfortable position. Position that's nice and relaxed, but also alert. And just take a few deep breaths to start the session in order to center ourselves and come into the present, come into our bodies. Start by being aware of the body simply sitting here, the sounds that are around, sounds from my voice, or the sounds from outside. Simply noticing what's occurring at this moment. And letting it be as is. Sounds just simply come and go.
And we can bring our awareness more fully in to the feeling of the body sitting here. It's weight against the seat. Different sensations. The body touches the ground or the seat. Feeling of the cloth against the skin. <coughs> the different sensations throughout the body. Tingling in the hands or the feet. Just take a few moments to scan your attention through your body, moving through the different parts from the head, down through the torso and the arms, down to the legs, the feet. And also notice if there's any tension anywhere, any tightness. Maybe in the shoulders or even in the face, in the back. And if you notice any tension or tightness, just try to soften, release that tension. Let it melt away. We can become more globally aware now of the different sensations throughout the body. The slight adjustments and movements it might make as it balances. The movements it makes as the breath comes and goes. In the abdomen, or in the chest, you can feel the breath in the back, in the shoulders. This area is around your nose where the breath comes and enters. See if you can spend a few moments noticing this whole breath body. Different sensations as the air comes and goes. The rising, the falling of the abdomen, expansion and contraction of the chest. Just 
See if you can follow along this process. Simply observe and follow this natural rhythm of the breath. Just like you'd sit on the shore of the ocean. You'd sit there still and watch the waves come in and go back out. Following their natural rhythm. While you sit in this place of stillness. Simply follow and watch the breath in this manner. I'm trying to control it. trying to hold on to it too tight. Just simply watching it come and go like the waves rolling in and rolling out.
the mind wanders off, drifts away, or gets distracted. There's no need to feel discouraged. Just whenever you notice the your awareness back to this feeling of the breath coming and going. Just that again, watching this natural rhythm. We do this over and over again. This is the job. This is the aim. So simply bring our awareness back to the present, back to the breath. To do it in a kind and gentle and warm and forgiving manner. the last few moments of the meditation. See if you can change the focus, your awareness, and place it in that spot where you usually feel different emotions or moods or mental states, like joy or happiness. For many people, this might be in the heart. Just see if you can rest your attention on that place for a few moments. And as you rest your awareness here, See if you can bring to mind somebody that has helped you in some way. That has been kind to you in some way. Might be a friend, a family member. Might even be a stranger or a pet. Just recall that act of kindness, however big or small. What kind of emotion or mental state does that bring up?
and reflect that your life is just a little bit better by having this person in it. Having this individual show you some kindness. Try to sink into that feeling or that emotion. It might be a feeling of reciprocal kindness or gratitude. Whatever it is, see if you can sink into it. And you can reflect that just as this person, this being has improved your own life in some way, but in some way you'll try to pay this kindness forward and try to share this goodness with another. even feel that intention welling up in you. And again, we can take a few deep breaths, bring our awareness back into our body. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Uttang dambang sangkang namasami to parang sakachang tammo so tapoti. Very good. Very good to meet everybody here again. And it's also very nice to meet people for the first time. And the first thing that you do with each other is actual uh, meditation. It's uh, I think it's a, always a nice way to start any kind of relationship with anybody. And so what I think is what I think in this is something that actually binds a lot of us together is this desire to practice some kind of meditation in some way or to develop mindfulness in some way. And I think for most people, why do we actually practice mindfulness? Why do we practice meditation? Why do we practice 
compassion. And I think for most people, there is some kind of aim behind it. There is some kind of desire to improve something about your existence. There's some desire to improve something about your mind. There's something, there's some kind of desire in some kind of way to make yourself a bit of a better person in some kind of way and improve something. But what you have to ask yourself is, you know, how does this actually happen? How does this improvement happen? How does this improvement of the mind actually happen? Is it something that is just automatic? Is it something that will just come from meditation? Is it something that happens in some kind of post hoc manner where it just automatically happens? Or is it something that we have to work on in some kind of way? And I think if we if we are quite honest with ourselves, I think we sort of we have to realize that actually it does require a little bit of work. Uh, and what is that work that we have to do? Uh, I think that work that we have to do is not only thinking about improving uh, our minds by trying to be mindful and control our thoughts, but also really taking a good look at our speech and our actions. Essentially, I think we have to be very focused on how we're ethically engaging in the world as well. This is a, I think this is a very important, important foundation to our practice. So what I thought I, I'd talk about today is uh, the development of mindfulness of our morality. This is something that the Buddha talked about in the, in the early Buddhist scriptures, where he talks about a practice called Silano Sati. Silano Sati essentially means mindfulness of one's morality. And how, what I would like to talk about is how we can actually use this as a form of meditation. Obviously, we know about mindfulness and compassion, um, but not many people know that we can actually do mindfulness of our morality as, a, as an actual practice. And there's a, I think there's a twofold benefit to this mindfulness of our morality, this silano sati, and the first benefit is that it does really uplift the mind. It does bring about a lot of very good and powerful and wholesome and bright and radiant qualities within the mind. But it also has the, the twofold uh, purpose of actually making us very aware of how we're ethically engaging in the world and any maybe shortcomings that we might have and any places that we're maybe not living up to this. So, you know, the first question to ask is, okay, well, I, you know, I want to meditate, but why, why should I think about morality in some kind of way? Why, why would I do something like that? And I think that if we do have this aim of wanting to improve our minds somehow, uh, we really, it, I think it's really, really important to actually start with our habitual speech and behavior. If we can't actually control our speech or behavior, how do we really actually expect to be able to control our mind? It's If you can't control these external things, it's going to be very hard to control the internal, internal aspects. And I guess a lot of people are resistant to thinking about morality and the way that we ethically engage in the world because there's this idea of that morality in some way is limiting. Uh, it's there's you know it stops you from doing things you know it's one of the big things that people ask you when you're a monk You've got all these rules to follow why can't you do this ah oh, that's so sad that you can't do this other thing or you can't do that um, but actually this aspect of having some kind of moral standard in some way this brings about a kind of freedom that we don't usually think of. This brings about a kind of liberation from different kinds of worries and different problems and different concerns that we have. This brings about a freedom from putting ourselves in situations that are quite, can be quite problematic in our lives. And one of the biggest things that it offers us is a, is a freedom from remorse. And this is uh, something that the Buddha actually talked about. There's a, there's a very nice stanza in the early Buddhist texts where the Buddha is talking to his attendant, Ananda. Uh, Ananda was his attendant for many, many years. And Ananda was probably the greatest gift to the Sangha. He kept asking the Buddha many, many questions and clarifying things. So 
A lot of the great clarifications we have come from Ananda. And there's one uh, there's one teaching in the in the early Buddhist texts where where Ananda asked the Buddha, what is the purpose and what is the benefit of having good morality? And the Buddha gave this really nice answer that the, the purpose and the benefit of having good morality is that it allows one freedom from remorse. And if we can just think about that, this uh, freedom from remorse, this is this is such an important quality to have. But you know, Ananda being Ananda being Ananda, Ananda was was, was again uh, asked further and got a lot more clarity on this. And Ananda further asked him, well, well, what is what is what is the benefit of freedom from remorse? What comes from freedom from remorse? And the Buddha said that that we have joy. And what comes from joy? The Buddha said rapture. And what comes from rapture? The Buddha said tranquility. What comes from tranquility? The Buddha said happiness. What comes from happiness? The Buddha said uh, the next one tranquility happiness. Happy, happiness. Uh, the next one is what comes from happiness is concentration. And what comes from concentration is the Buddha said that there's knowledge and vision of of things as they are. What comes from knowledge and visions of things as they are is that uh, turning away and uh, letting go. And what comes from turning away and letting go? And the Buddha finally said, knowledge and, and vision of liberation. So we can see that just from this simple aspect of uh, the benefits and the purposes of morality, this is actually something that brings a lot of good and qualities up in the mind. A lot of these factors that are leading us towards enlightenment. So it's one of so this aspect of having uh, 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 reflecting on a morality. This really is actually the bedrock of uh, moving towards these higher mind states and moving towards enlightenment. And so, you know, we have to sort of ask ourselves, uh, ask ourselves, well, 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 you know, what actually is the kind of morality that we're thinking about? Um, you know, isn't morality just rules? Isn't this sort of some sort of, isn't morality just a lots of do's and a lots of don'ts, a lots of shoulds, a lots of should nots? Isn't it all just, isn't it all just dogmatic following of some kind of particular way of being. And while, and again, I think this is one of the, the uh, resistances that a lot of people have that, that is that they think morality and having some kind of ethical standard is that. Now, obviously, if we're thinking about this from a Buddhist perspective, you know, we have the uh, the five ethical trainings that we have. Uh, this is This is a very... I think this is a very useful way for us to ethically engage in the world. But obviously some people are a little bit resistant to follow a preconceived uh, religious uh, doctrine of ethics. And that's, you know, that's totally fine. So a lot of people will think about morality in their own terms and what is important to them, what's not important to them. I think, I think both of these methods are fine as long as, as one is clear about where one's you know, uh, ethical standards lie, but whichever whichever means that you take of this, whether it's a pre-existing ethical standard or it's an ethical standard that you actually build up and and develop for yourself, this is not just something of a line in the sand of I should and I should not do this. Morality and having an ethical standard really involves an aspect of reflective wisdom. It really involves being very circumspect with every situation that we're in and seeing, you know, what's the harm that I could be causing? What's the right thing to do here in this particular situation? How should I operate? It really does involve a lot of wisdom. It's not just blindly, dogmatically following some kind of rules. We need a lot of introspection. We need a lot of discernment. We need a lot of self-control. We need to very much go against our impulses in so many different kinds of ways. So having an ethical standard really does involve wisdom and reflection. And this is, I think this is one of the most the, the underrated parts of, of developing this ethical standard. 
and also what it what it entails of us as well is to be honest with ourselves being you know being moral in these kinds of ways it's a big thing is about being honest with others but actually you have to be very very honest with yourself you have to see where's where am i actually not living up to the things my own standards where am i not living up to uh, what kind of shortcomings might I have? You know, I, I generally, for me, I generally think I'm a good person, but you know, I'm not, not always, not always totally nice. You know, I have my bad moments, uh, just as as much as anybody else. So it really requires us to to look inside and do a lot of reflective uh, wisdom work. And so, how do we actually then develop this? Then, how do we develop this? this mindfulness of our morality um, so I think that, that there's there's well there's one way that in the in the early Buddhist text where we where the Buddha actually recommends exactly how we can actually do this develop this this kind of mindfulness and then there's then there's the work that we can do ourselves and there's a, we can build on this in the reflective work we can do ourselves and both manner both means of actually doing this are a way for us to again uplift our minds in some way but then also look at maybe our shortcomings that we might have as well and so there's a there's a few passages in the early buddhist suttas where the buddha is talking to somebody called uh, mahanama he was a he was a uh, very devout lay disciple and uh, but he was also he was also a very Busy and active member of the community, so he'd come and ask the Buddha these uh, all these different questions about how to actually to best lead one's life in the world. And so the Buddha, uh, on a few different occasions, uh, talked to Mahanama about what he called the six the six reflective inspirations. So the six topics for reflective inspiration, um, and these were. As were the you know the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, uh, but also morality, and generosity, and and the uh, recollections of of the devas or the celestial beings. And the Buddha said that these are the causes for you know uplifting our mind. And I'm going to read the I've got the notes here, so I because I it's a big chunk of passage and I forget these things. So so when the Buddha uh, spoke to Mahanama about these things. There's a few different suttas where he talks about this and he uses a particular stanza, but then he follows it up with how you actually do this and the benefits of this. And when he talked about uh, uh, mindfulness of morality, he said, you know, Mahanama, this is where you recollect your own virtues and you recollect in this way of that they, your your own your ethical standards, your ethical conduct, it's untorn, it's unbroken, unspotted. It's unsplattered, unsplattered, yeah. It's but they are also they're also these are the things that are praised by the wise. This is the speech and action that's praised by the wise. This is these are liberating, these are conductive to concentration. And the Buddha said when somebody recollects on their morality in this way, that they their mind is freed from any greed, hatred, and delusion. Their mind is straight in that time and their mind is straight and connected with the goal and focused on the goal of the Dhamma. Their mind is in line with the Dhamma and when their mind is in line with the Dhamma and the goal, then, then you know, one experiences, again, one experiences joy, one experiences rapture, one experiences tranquility, one experiences happiness and one experiences concentration. So the Buddha said that we should recollect on our ethics in this kind of way and again this would this is a cause to uplift our mind and the way he states that this is a kind of meditation and, and that, that 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 is that this is a kind of mindfulness he he ends that stanza by saying uh mahanama you should recollect like this when you're standing when you're sitting when you're walking when you're lying down when you're busy at work when you're when you're at home and uh with your family you should recollect in this way constantly. So this actually shows that this is a mindfulness of morality. This is like the normal kind of mindfulness that we might develop. This is something that we should do and we should recollect on quite often. And in another iteration of this same teaching where he says that you know, recollecting your virtue is they're untorn, they're unbroken, they're liberating, they, um, 
he ends up he ends up by saying uh, he ends up by saying when a when a noble disciple uh, reflects reflects in this way you they are somebody that's uh, balanced among the unbalanced they are they are somebody that is uh, lives troubled untroubled among the troubled somebody that reflects and can reflect in this way has actually entered the stream and this is a shorthand for reaching the first level of enlightenment um, and they can do this through this recollection of their ethical teaching so we can see that this is not only something that we can develop within our lives uh, at all time and in the most and really in the most important place where does ethics live it's in our lives it's when we're standing when we're walking when we're moving around in the world is when we're working, it's when we're with our families. This is the time that we need to actually recollect on it, be mindful of it. And that this is something that this kind of recollection, if we use it skillfully, this is something that can allow us to progress on the path. And so, you know, we can do this recollection that the Buddha recommended, but we can also really build on this. And as I said, this, this really requires us to use a lot of reflective wisdom so we have to go deeper with it. We can't we can't just sort of rest on that laurel of you know, using it to uplift our mind in some way. We really do have to reflect on it. And we can do this by, you know, say for example, if we far we follow the you know the five ethical trainings in Buddhism, you know, that again that's fine. Uh, but if we just uh, have you know our own kind of ethical standard, then that's fine. But we we rec we can recollect and reflect on different aspects of this. So say, for example, it's, if it's the first precept to refrain from or to train not to kill or to harm any other beings, we can reflect on harm if we're just doing it from a, from a non-Buddhist perspective. We can just reflect on harm. What, what does harm feel like within your mind? If you have harmful mind states, if you think of somebody that you work with that is... Uh, is annoying you or somebody that's noisy or somebody that's on the road that's that's uh that's you're know, cutting you off or something what does what does a harmful or violent thought feel like in the mind what does that actually feel to you but also what is it like to be free from that impulse we reflect in this way and again if we're thinking about the uh, five ethical trainings we can think Say, for example, with something like lying, we can think for ourselves, you know, what's it like to be lied to? What's it like for somebody to criticize us? What's it like for somebody to gossip about us? What's it like for somebody to, to, to speak harsh words to us? But then again, we again reflect, what's it like to, if somebody's truthful to us, if somebody's honest, if somebody's supportive, if somebody's um, using their speech in this very kind way. We can reflect further. Well, what do we really think harm is? What's, what is harm for me? What's the line that I say that I'm being harmful to myself or I'm starting to be harmful to others? And this line that I have, this point where I say, this is actually harming me, this is harming others, am I always living up to that? Am I living within this boundary or do i have some kinds of shortcomings in some ways so we continue to reflect on this and you know, look into our own experience and look into our own thoughts our own speech our own behaviors but you know we don't we don't do this in this kind of in this kind of in this uh, uh, mean spirited or critical or your know, inquisition type manner you know you have to do this in a way that's very much like a, a wise and warm friend that is actually you know giving you some good advice and trying to direct you in the right way you don't want to criticize yourself i'm such a bad person i'm so terrible i, I can't i i want to do the right thing and i keep doing the wrong thing no it's you have to reflect on this more in this way of uh, a wise mentor or a wise friend who just kindly guides you in the right direction so I think with with this, as I said, uh, this reflection on morality and this mindfulness of our morality and this meditation on morality, it is a way that we can actually develop the mind. And we can actually see that this is something that 
not only benefits us, but benefits others as well. This is something that actually leads us towards liberation. There's a, a short, a, a short a section in the Majjhima Nikaya where somebody asks the Buddha, well, what's the purpose of practice? What's the purpose of meditation? And the Buddha said it's for one's own benefit. It's for the benefit of others. It's for, and it's for Nibbana. And we can see, or enlightenment. And we can see that this mindfulness of morality, this uh, recollection of morality as a form of meditation, this is for our benefit. This is for other people's benefit. And this is, is actually something that leads us towards Nibbana. And so just to, just to finish this up, there is this really nice, section in the in the uh, part of the early Buddhist text called the Theragatha, where it's the inspired, it's called the inspired utterances of the, the of the elders. And actually, I have to thank Sarah. Sarah actually pointed me to, to, to this and got me looking, looking into this and started to look up a few teachings. And this is, I think this is just a nice way to, to end this with this kind of inspired, inspired utterance. utterance. It's, it's from something called the Seal of Art. Um, uh, and it's, and I'm not sure exactly which senior monk said it, but it's, it's, it's good nonetheless. So the, the quote is, the, the inspired utterance is, in this existence, one should above all train oneself in terms of morality. Morality, when cultivated, brings you success. A moral person gains many friends on account of their ability to master their impulses. But an immoral person, one who is guided by, by evil, gets alienated from friends. Morality is the beginning, the support and primary cause of all good qualities. Therefore, make your morality pure. Morality is also the control, the gathering in and the, the delighting of the mind. It's the way whereby Buddhas have crossed the flood. Therefore, make your morality pure. And so I don't think there's any better way to actually end this talk by that inspired utterance. So with that, I'll, I'll finish speaking here and you know, hopefully you gain something from it. Uh, so anything that I've said tonight may this afternoon, may this be a cause for you to develop some kind of insight, develop some kind of wisdom. Hopefully it's been useful for you in some way. Um, any goodness that comes about from this, I hope you can take this into your own life and into your own practice. Uh, anything that I've said that, that might be, that might be, uh, that might be wrong, you know, please forgive me, forgive me for it. Um, and, uh, and, if anybody has any questions now, maybe we can open it up to questions. So with that, oh yeah, we can open it up to any questions. Okay. Any questions online as well, you can yell at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a Thai person in here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody ever done this kind of practice, uh, like a meditation on your morality or a recollection on your morality, yeah. where you ethically engage in the world? Yeah, a little bit. In what ways? What, so, what ways do you try to do it? Well, at the moment, I have a gratitude journal. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. They're not Buddhist. They're more mm. just Christian Baha'i. Yep. And so, and it's, that's actually a question I sort of have for you. Mm. Because they have, there's a lot of um, virtues like, you know, wonder and yeah. awe and creativity, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you don't really hear about those yeah. in, in Buddhism. Mm. So I was wondering, can you say something about that? Because it's just that they're not in the popular sutras? Or, yeah. Well, because mm, I, I especially... I guess mainly when you're thinking about the early Buddhist texts and these kind of positive mind states there, the Buddha mainly talks about them in terms of they become a factor towards concentration or, or enlightenment. And so things like, you know, things like creativity, wonder, awe, um, I guess something like awe actually does play into it, but maybe the Buddha didn't really talk about awe specifically. Maybe, maybe he did in some kind of way. But, of a development of faith in some kind of way. But yeah, there are those kinds of wholesome virtues, you could say, that, that do uplift the mind to, to some extent um, and do uh, and are a support for the mind. 
uh, whether something like creativity would be a factor towards you know, enlightenment or, or concentration. Uh, I'm not sure how exactly how some, say for example, something like that would fit in. I could see something like awe aiding and assisting in concentration and, and enlightenment. Um, but yeah, so I, th I think generally, you know, all these other virtues that are there, I, you know, I, there's, not, there's nothing really wrong with them, but I think maybe just the Buddha was maybe a, a little bit more along the lines of this is a specific kind of virtue or mental state that will lead you towards concentration and, and enlightenment. And, but look, you know, if you can get all from looking at a brilliant piece of art or or you can get, uh, you know, the creativity of, of how I can be a more generous and kind person. Um, these, you know, these other kinds of virtues, I think they're very, very useful. There's no, there's no hard line in the sand of, you know, these are good virtues and, and these are only, these are Buddhist virtues and I should only cultivate these Buddhist virtues because they're found in the, in the, in the early Buddhist suttas and these other virtues, I'm not going to worry about them. If they're wholesome and they're useful, I think yeah, definitely you, uh, you know, focus on them and use them you know, skillfully. Any questions or? <laughs> well, the yeah. many nice things you say and um, mm. when we think about is it external to internal like we purify our speech and action mm. and if you think of them as external mm. and then the mind and the practice and the meditation as internal yeah which way um, does it go like from external to internal or internal to external yeah you know, my thoughts are not fully formed but i yeah just like to bring that up and think about what actually happened? Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a it's a good ref, it's a good reflection, and in some way, I think they at least have to start internally, mm -hmm. and then they move externally. You know, we can't we can't we can't say or do anything without some kind of motivation or intention to actually do it. So it does start from you know, mind is the forerunner. Okay. Mind is the forerunner. So it. it it is, this is the thing that starts to move out into the world and into our speech and our actions. But also I would say that it, it's symbiotic in this way as well. And that once we start performing these, you know, performing these good speech and good actions, it's a, it's a bit of a, it becomes a, like a feedback loop of coming, coming back internally as well. And again, uh, like, like the Buddha said, uh, well, you know, why do we actually do morality to bring up joy, to bring up rapture, to bring up tranquility? And so it starts feeding back into the mind in that way and uplifting the mind. And as the mind becomes more uplifted, then we have more, you could say, better intentions to actually do things in the world. So I think there is this very symbiotic relationship there. And also just and when we do do uh, things that are uh, external in the world like this, it does make you feel good you know it's uh, even sometimes if it's a bit superficial you, know, you say something you try to uh, say something nice to this person and you just try to do it and sometimes you fail and sometimes it comes off yeah. sometimes it doesn't but either way when you do say something nice something about the person's whole demeanor like lights up you know because you're at least trying you're at least trying and people can see that and they there's, so you get that kind of feedback of like, I've done something good for this person and they feed that back into you. And so this, this, this is something that it is external that becomes internal through our senses as well. And this, again, feeds the mind. So I think there's a real symbiotic relationship there between the internal and external. But if we're thinking about the root cause, it, the root condition, it does have to be internal to external. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, because yeah, and, and another and another point on top of that is like we can also think of uh, ingenuine actions and speech as well. You know, it's it's pretty. You know, people can do things in a pro-social manner to, or in a in a moral manner to manipulate people. 
yeah. to to deceive people or to trick people into doing something or, or as a form of grandstanding that you know I'm I look at look at me I give lots of money aren't I aren't I such a good person or or I say look at me I say all these nice things to people so we can use moral speech and actions and behavior actually for an immoral way in some mm -hmm. way so it's not just it's not yeah just the external sometimes doesn't always mean that it's it's actually moral yeah. you know, obviously when we when we think about this from the Buddhist perspective, um, when we think of what what karma is, you know, it's, it's intentions, actions, and consequences. So the intentions sort of have to line up with the actions and the consequences in some kind of meaningful way. So I do, again, I, as well. I think it arises from in the internal, but then it has this symbiotic relationship with the internal and external. But if it's just being external, then we do have to be careful because sometimes it can be used in a way that's you know, not so not so moral. Beautiful. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Do you have time for one more question? <clears throat> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, thinking about what you're saying about people can't be honest with others unless they're honest with themselves. Yeah. I have a dear friend that I know well. And I have a sense that she's not being honest with herself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What would you encourage someone in my position? Yeah. To you know, how can I support her yeah. in that moment where she's really wrestling with with that? And and you know, I don't want to be presumptive or mm. prescriptive. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. our friendship is a deep enough one yeah. where I feel like I know that she's maybe not listening deeply to herself or not telling herself the right. truth. Just to just to clarify a little bit, is this something that is coming out in her behavior, or is this just something uh, uh, like a kind of external truth that she's not facing up to? Some, you know, is this a kind of thing that's causing her to behave in a particular kind of way, or something about a reality that she's just not accepting? I think it's coming out in behavior. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess you know the the main thing and we were talking about this yesterday Sarah is you know the main thing is that well one you want to be like when you're reflecting on your own morality you don't want to do it in this kind of critical and judgmental and you know bring the hammer down kind of <laughs> kind of way that that doesn't ever really work we want to do it in this manner where it is like a kind and generous friend and, a, and somebody who really cares for you and concerns uh, is concerned in some kind of way so we have to we have to try to approach the situation like that. And again, think about our own intention first. What's our intention of trying to help them? You know, is our intention to fix them or is our intention to really actually help help this person? Um, so the first big thing is getting our own intention right of why we want to actually help help the person. The second The second big thing is that if it is really maybe something that is like fundamental to this person and you know that they're obviously holding on to it for some kind of reason and you know the last thing we want to do is like attack that you know maybe it's acting as some kind of defense mechanism in some kind of way so you don't want to attack this thing straight away you don't want to go hey you're doing this and it's because of you you're thinking in this way and as, as if sometimes if you hit too raw of a nerve people become defensive. They don't want to listen. It's like, no, you're wrong. They shut down. So usually a very skillful way to try to do these things is to maybe you start sort of surface level things, things that are maybe, you know, we, we're always like this. It's like, it's that, you know, it's very easy for us to see everybody else's problems. Like it's, it's so like, it's so obvious. Like you're having this problem and it's because of this. And that, like, it's just so obvious. But for that person, it's not obvious. So you don't want to, you don't want to sort of like throw that on them straight away, because it is protecting them in some way. Like something, something about this thing they can't see. You know, if they could see that this was causing them suffering, they'd do something about it. But they just don't see it because it is, it's in some way become core to their being. So what we want to try and do is get around the edges of that first. 
find ways where we can go, well, okay, well, you're doing this thing and it's, you're behaving in this kind of way. You just want to sort of tap at the edges, like find these little things. Well, you know, you behave in like, this thing that you do. Like, you know, why, what, you know, what's this, what kind of negative impact does this have? You know, you, know, you might see the problem as, okay, you're denying something deep inside. But, you know, you ask these like smaller questions first. And why do you, you know, why does this, you know, if you do this, like what sort of impact does this have on your behavior? Start to get them to question the, themselves. As opposed to telling them what you think is wrong, you get them to question this, this core thing themselves where they're not being honest with themselves. And, and I think by, by skillfully asking the person questions, they start to ask their own questions. Um, if you if you just berate them, it's like nobody nobody, like, nobody listens. The people don't listen to that. But if you can you can ask them questions, and you can then you understand more about it. Then you can get them to ask questions about these things as well. This is usually the uh, a better way to go about it. In saying all that, sometimes the sledgehammer approach is good. <laughs> <laughs> like, like sometimes sometimes we just like sometimes we need that like that slap in the face just to go. Hey, like, so pick your method. <laughs> so. Can I go back to your mm. fairness question about mm. creativity? Yeah. There's one more that she asked. Wonder, I think it was Wonder, yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm thinking about how those things function in my life and the lives of people I'm close to, whether it's not. Mm. Um, I'm so far from an expert, mm. right? So, like, very much at the beginning of my path. So, yeah. I'll, I'll put this out there just for uh, sake of discussion. But I actually feel like I see the connections between those virtues and all the things we talk about here mm. really clearly, mm. Um, mm. in the sense that I feel like all can really. Um, serve as incredible tools. When I when I think of, of myself or others in creative or in a moment of awe, I think of those as the moments where the mental chatter of past and future is least directing the energy of that moment, right? Mm -hmm. I think I think of those things very much as things that support my practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm open to being told that that's um, coloring a little bit outside the lines, but <laughs> I, I, I think I see it all as being being quite interconnected. Yeah, um, I'm anybody that knows me knows that I'm very much a proponent of if it works for you, do that thing. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, the, the, there's no there's no sort of line in the sand that you have to go. Well, no, that's right, that's wrong. If you know, if, if it is actually something that works for you and is up, uplifting your mind in some kind of way, then yeah, do that do that thing. And if it is supportive in some way, do that. Like. This uh, an experience of awe. That's you know, if, if we're using awe as the as the example here. So this is this is once when when people do have these very strong uh, uh, experiences from things like meditation, awe is actually one of the factors that that people usually experience. The sense of awe, the sense of unity, the sense of uh, you know, intense emotional experience in this kind of way. Uh, this wonder, this acceptance for you know, the experience that one's having, these are wrapped up in the, you could say even in a, like in a very powerful meditative experience. So it's not to say not to say that those kinds of characteristics are, uh, are contrary to the, the Buddhist path. You know that they, they do arise in different ways within one's own mind, and. Different people have different subjective experiences with these things, and if those different subjective experiences are leading one to a, you know, more kind of close, uh, further down the path, then there's nothing, there's totally nothing wrong with them. Okay. So I, they're not, they're not mutually exclusive. Just as I said, just because they're not in some kind of Buddhist taxonomy somewhere, mm -hmm. then oh, well, I can't, I can't do wonder, like yeah. because it's, you know, it's not in the Abhidharma, like. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. Again, if if something works for you, then do that thing. If I think in a lot of the uh, 
the sort of wellness terminology of the current moment. Yeah. I feel like I see the Buddha's fingerprints in it. Yeah. Through, yeah. These, mm -hmm. through these various words, right, that mm -hmm. are not sort of synonymous, mm -hmm. but yet at a similar, I feel like mm -hmm. awe in particular, um, I imagine as being the dissolution of the ego in something yeah. larger, yeah. right, yeah. even yeah. just for a moment, yeah. so I think it's very much at the heart of yeah. what we've Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Did you finish? Okay, yeah, very good. Yeah, good. I, I like rooms like this. It's nice and intimate. It's <laughs> just chat to people. Yeah. Sometimes you talk with a lot of people and get a bit. Yeah. There's hundred people here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could, I couldn't have broken the fourth wall with the Zoom. <laughs> Nice to meet you all. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you for coming.